Okay, next. No internet. No internet. Good morning, Hillcrest. Glad that you're with us this morning. Hope that you're having a great Sunday getting kicked off with um, church this morning. So if you are, um, you know, looking and you see down below, there's a little thing that says share there at the bottom. Hit that share button and then invite people that you know you haven't seen come on yet because, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they slept in or maybe they're getting that cup of coffee or maybe they're kind of like lost track of time. But uh, if you hit those uh, invites on there, it'll you know, let your friends know they can join us and be a part of church today. We've got a lot of cool stuff in store for you today. Uh, Jason's going to be talking a little bit more about that third art piece that we're going to reveal today. Uh, and uh, Tarina is joining us for our final songs, uh, doing a uh, dangle song. So it'd be kind of a cool, cool morning. So I uh, hope that you're doing well. Uh, we're going to kick off this morning with some worship. And so I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey and the worship team. And we're going to we're going to get rolling. Jesus' name, life's made 
Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, worship team. We're glad that you're joining us for service this morning. And there's a lot of discussion about whether or not you should be wearing a mask. We're not going to get into that here to this, this morning, but we are going to have some fun with wearing a mask. And so we've got some folks dressed up with a mask on. Uh, the first one is Taylor Swift. And so you need to predict A, B, and C, using A, B, and C in the comments, what you think is underneath that mask. Is she smiling, frowning, or straight-faced? Go ahead. I'm going to go with frown. That's my answer. B. What do we got? Straight-faced. All right. So give yourself a point if you put C. The next one isn't a person, it's a thing, but it's delicious. Macaroons. What color of macaroon is beneath the mask? Is it pink, yellow, or blue? Why does a macaroon have to wear a mask? But I'm Ching. I don't I got nothing nothing for that. I got nothing for that. <laughs> They're overpriced downtown though, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and the answer is. Pink. All right, one more. Even The Rock is masking up. He's tough and stuff, but he's wearing a mask. What's beneath The Rock's mask? Smell up what The Rock's been cooking. Is it a beard? I probably botched that too, right? Clean or goatee? Which one is it? Got to be the goatee, right? See? Yes, classic rock. See, all right, thanks for playing. On to the announcement portion of this service. We have a business meeting today that'll be at 11.30 following this service uh, in the Facebook group. So if you're in the group, Pastor Doug sent out uh, an event invite for that meeting. Uh, so click there, real user-friendly for you to follow along today on that meeting. This Wednesday night, Trina and I are hosting a family trivia game night through Zoom and Kahoot. So uh, those are real words. Those are actual real, real things. Uh, and if you're interested in playing that, go to our website, sign up for that, or let me know if you want to play that this Wednesday. Thursday Night Live, Hillcrest Live, Thursday at 7. Pastor Doug's got some good stuff. I'm not sure what he's doing uh, this time. Any, any teasers there? No. Going to shave the beard. He's going to shave the beard, people. It's coming off live <laughs> on Thursday. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> and then... Finally, Sunday, May 31st, Hillcrest is going to virtually recognize our grads, our fifth grade students, our high school graduates, our college graduates, any post-college graduates. So if you have a graduate and you haven't let Jen Simons or myself know that information, please let us know this week so that we can make sure we recognize them. Back to you, Kels.
Let's pray. Father, we praise you and worship you that you are a God of miracles. We thank you and praise you for the daily miracles you do in our lives, through the needs that you provide for, through the relationships that you restore, through the health that you grant, through the resources you provide, through the talent that you give. And Father, we praise you for the big miracles you have done in our lives as well. We thank you for our salvation through your son, Jesus. We thank you that we can gather and worship you today. And Father, some of us are desperately wanting a miracle from you too. And so we give those needs and those requests to you at this point, this time. We pray, Father, you would do a miracle in our lives and do a miracle in the needs that we have and the things that we want you to see you make happen for us and for our families and for our communities and for our neighbors, for our workplaces. Father, as Pastor Doug comes in a few moments to continue our Scarlet Thread Redemption series, may you open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us today. We thank you so much for the opportunity we have to give to you. We pray that we would use our time and our talent and our treasure to bring people closer to who you are. We thank you so much for this time and this place. It's your name we pray. Amen. Before I get started with the message this morning, uh, if you're following along in the comment threads, apparently Sherry Guzzi is feeling especially affectionate today. You know, the scriptures say that we should greet each other with a holy kiss. Um, but, uh, you know, Sherry, it's a challenge for her. She's, you know, because of our social distancing. But um, nice to know that you're engaged here, Sherry. And, and it's your dad. And, uh, yeah, and, and uh, loving up on my dad. I appreciate that. So... If you don't know what I'm talking about, follow the comment threads. They're beautiful. You just beautiful. Said love so, yes, I did just say that. So, Easter, let's get on with what we're here to talk about today. Uh, Easter was only five weeks ago. And as Easter comes, every time Easter comes, uh, the church should be and, and is talking about the resurrection, talking about Jesus' sacrifice that he made and the resurrection. Good Friday, of course, focusing on that sacrifice. Easter morning, focusing on that resurrection. Really uh, important part of our Christian faith. The thing is, is that uh, 
It, it seems to be that many people find some confusion with this um, idea of why Jesus had to sacrifice and what the resurrection really means. And if they try to explain it to someone, they're a little bit dumbfounded. They're not exactly sure what they should be saying or how they should communicate this. They know it's important. They know it's significant. But how, how is it significant or how is it important? If you've been around church for a while, you, you might have a good understanding of this. You might be able to clearly explain this to others. But even when I went through seminary and even pastors that I know today have a hard time understanding this concept that is a foundational, basic concept of our faith. So I want to be sure that, that we understand that together, and I want to communicate it as clearly as I possibly can so that you will be able to understand it for yourself and also explain it or uh, you know, help someone else maybe that doesn't quite understand it uh, be able to understand it. So as a part of this series, uh, as we have been doing this, I have been inviting Jason up to talk about the art piece that he has developed. Now today we're talking about the Gospels. That's the first four books of the New Testament. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The title of the message today is, is the, the introduction to uh, this, this Redeemer being revealed. And so the Gospels reveal who our Redeemer is, ultimately being Jesus. The Gospels are four books, all telling about the same period of time, just from four different perspectives, four different authors. Uh, those authors talk about different aspects of Jesus's life and talk about different aspects of certain events. Some talk about the exact same events or aspects of an event. But these are four eyewitness accounts, descriptions, tellings of Jesus's life, his ministry. And uh, we call those the Gospels. So today we're focusing on those. And so in doing so, Jason put together uh, an art piece for this. This is the third one that we're going to see in this series but it is also only the third of 20 pieces that he created for this exhibit that's going to be installed in the church that's, you know, 35, 40 feet long. And I can't wait for you guys to see this when it's all done and complete as we all come back into the facility together. But, uh, but I want Jason to be able to come up and share a little bit about this uh, specific piece. So, Jason, why don't you come on up and share with us? Thank you, Doug. And back for... Round three. So um, this particular piece, uh, let's let's bring up this one. We'll reveal it here and show people what we got here. If we can go full screen on that one. Um, so the way that these pieces are arranged, um, the first one, the Torah, the Gospels, and then uh, the final piece in the series um, are the largest pieces. They're actually poster size. Uh, full 36 by 24 or larger. The rest of them measure about 16 by 12. Um, this particular piece uh, for myself is probably the most significant in what I was doing. Um, a little backstory with this. Uh, I saved this piece, everything I did with the artwork. This was the last piece I did every time. And every time I did this piece, the center point uh, with Christ there outstretched on the cross with no cross being there, um, was the last point of contact I had with every piece of this art exhibit. So what's unique about this one, um, we're going to zoom in on the bottom left corner, and we'll go full screen on that so people can see. So the way this starts out, it, it's, there's, there's some significance in every little bit of this. Uh, the first part is this seed and the significance of new life. Um, a new beginning, a representation of, you know, the birth of Christ, um, which obviously we celebrate around Christmas time, and then the 33 years that Christ did walk the earth in the ministry that he led. The scarlet thread there, you'll see that red thread that weaves throughout. Now, I did keep the colors minimal through all of the art pieces. In fact, there's only three of them that actually have color in them, and the idea behind that is Black and white allows you to focus more on the work and not be distracted by the color. So with this piece, uh, that seed being the new life, the new beginning, the start of our redemption, um, and which we all know from the beginning, the first piece, the Torah, uh, the, the redemption that God, God gives us has started clear back at the beginning of, uh, back in the garden, 
of, of Eden. So um, this is just this one particular piece, but this thread weaves its way throughout. Now, when we move up through this piece, we're gonna go to the next segment, which is actually Christ outstretched on the cross, but there's no cross. Um, for me, it was just a great significance. Um, I wanted to focus on, on Jesus himself. Um, every church we go into, every book we read that is in some way related to Christianity, whatever it is, there always seems to be the symbol of the cross. The cross is, is great, but I wanted to focus on the reason for that cross and why we have that as a symbol in our faith. And that is because Christ is outstretched. Now, when we look at that, um, it's, it's probably the most common pose we see. I wanted it to be relatable for people, but I wanted to give a little bit more of a story with it too. And you'll notice the thread starts to wrap its way around Christ. And what's that, what that signifies is how our redemption comes from being completely wrapped up in our faith, how we are wrapped in this life of devotion to Christ and how Christ has wrapped himself in our sins and his death was there for us to be redeemed. And then, of course, at the end, when things are said and done, um, we'll go up to the upper right corner of this. And as we zoom in on this, you'll notice the thread comes up, uh, the hand of Christ reaching down, obviously the scar in the hand with the hole. Um, <clears throat> the thread goes through the hole in the hand as a symbol of the sacrifice that was made. And it's, it's just a, another way of remembering. Um, this thread, again, was made with the blood red paint. Uh, it does have some transparent um, properties to it. You can still th see through stuff. Uh, a lot of little significant things with this, um, but the outstretched hand. And then if we go back to the main piece as a whole, and we'll zoom in on that one more time, you'll just see how things kind of tie together. Now, the little city in the background, obviously everybody knows, um, silhouette of Jerusalem itself. Um, that is more there as a symbol of there, there's this depth perception I wanted to create. And I wanted to give the presence of Christ being perched upon the cross, up on the hill in Golgotha, and then overlooking everything else that we know um, about the Holy Land. And it's just one of the more significant silhouettes that we see. So this piece was the most significant to me. Um, it just spoke to me throughout the whole thing. Like I said, it was the last piece. That center point was the last thing I touched every time I worked on these, from the stencil cutting, the drawings, the painting, everything. Um, as it all culminates through and into the end, uh, it was a complete joy to work on this one. You'll notice all of these pieces are gonna have an artist statement that goes with them. There's a significance to this one. There is no words for me about this piece on this one. It is literally some scripture and it's there for your thought and your contemplative thought about where you are in your faith and where Christ lands in your heart and how you follow with what he has done for us. So with that, we'll turn things back over to Doug and uh, enjoy the lesson. Thank you, Jason. Show him some love. Click some emojis at the bottom and uh, thank Jason for uh, taking the risk and standing in front of all of you in your living rooms or wherever you're at and talking about this art piece. It's so personal to him. I think also, um, Vaughn, let's jump back to the main one. Just blow that up real, real uh, large here for a second. One of the other cool things about this and some of these, you know, it's like any art. When you look at it, you start to see more and more symbolism in this. But when I looked at this art piece, I noticed how that scarlet thread wrapped six times around Jesus and then the seventh time being his hand. And of course, seven being this, this uh, number of perfection and completion in the scriptures and how Jesus' sacrifice is this full completion of the kingdom come. So not just the earthly aspect of what he did, but the kingdom aspect as well being that seventh final wraparound. So uh, just really cool as you, as you look at this art um, all these different pieces, it just more and more starts to, to jump out at you. And I think that's what you're going to love about this piece is the first time you're going to see it, well, you're going to be amazed because of its size and, the uh, you know, the professionalism and quality of the pieces. 
But as you just ponder week in and week out looking at these, you're going to see more and more details that you didn't notice before. And it's just rich with it. So love this and so excited that we get to have this as a part of our community of faith here. Okay, if I asked you to explain why Jesus had to die on the cross, how would you explain it? It should be difficult for most because it is a difficult concept to understand. We know that he had to, but why did he have to? Maybe if you have some ideas on this or even some questions as I uh, go along here, because I I want to explain this as clearly as I know how to do so. But if there's some questions that come up, uh, drop those down in the comments, and then I'll take a look at those as we go along here and and hopefully be able to, um, you know, uh, answer those as we go along. But the question, just the basic question, if you had to explain to someone else that didn't know, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? How well do you think you could do at explaining it in a way that they would understand it or that they would be able to comprehend it? And also in a short discussion, you know, no one wants a two hour answer um, or a whole theology lesson. Why did this have to happen? And and is that something that we're able to uh, be able to clearly communicate? What I want to do is I want to show you uh, a a couple of clips here to start us off. These clips are from two different pastors that are trying to explain the need for Jesus to die on the cross and the simplicity of that. Um, And the first pastor uh, is from a different tradition than what we're used to here. Uh, He is a little bit more animated, I guess you would say, in his teaching. The second guy is being interviewed in his office, both pastors and both trying to explain this. And in no way am I making fun of these two guys. They're doing the best they can to explain this, but it leaves some questions in the way they explain it, even in saying, this is so simple. And I might find myself doing that right here this morning as soon as they're done. But I want you to take a look at these two, ponder like how well you think they're communicating that, how that resonates with what you know and understand. And then when they're done, I want to talk a little bit about these two and then do my best to explain this as well. So take a look at these uh, two clips that are mashed together. God's word needs to be preached clearly, distinctly, and plainly. And if it's not, the result is confusion. Number one, there is confusion about salvation. And I'll tell you why. People are getting a mixed message and it's confusing them. It's confusing them. You see, there's nothing confusing about this that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's nothing confusing about that. There's nothing confusing about for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. There's nothing confusing about for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There's nothing confusing about that. There's nothing confusing about whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. There's nothing confusing about whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. God dwelleth in him and he in God. There's nothing confusing about the fact that the Bible says, what must I be to be saved? And the answer is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. See, there's nothing confusing about he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. But he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on. There's nothing confusing about John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. There's nothing confusing about Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. There's nothing confusing about verily, verily, I say unto thee, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. There's nothing confusing about salvation when he said, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness. There's nothing confusing about the gospel. There's nothing confusing about salvation. But the reason people are confused is because they're getting a mixed message. Because one minute it's all faith. And then the next minute it's repent of your sins. Confusing. Which one is it? You say, repenting of your sins is part of faith. Liar. No, it isn't. 
because repenting of your sins has to do with your sins and faith has to do with believing in Jesus. They're two totally different things. Right? How do I know if I'm truly a follower of Christ? And scripture even encourages us in places like 2 Corinthians 13, 5 to test ourselves, examine ourselves, to see if we're in the faith. And so we need to ask the question first and foremost, have we repented and believed? Have we turn from our sin and ourselves and trusted in Jesus as Savior and Lord have we turned aside from our every effort to save ourselves and said only in Christ by faith alone in him can I be made right before God have you leaned completely on him for salvation have you submitted your life to him as the Savior and Lord that he is and so have you repented and believed these are questions that scripture beckons us to ask and then scripture gives us books like 1 John. I would encourage anybody struggling with assurance of salvation to spend time in 1 John. And, and 1 John's written so that we might have assurance. We might know that we are followers of Christ. And that assurance is based on the past work of Christ on a cross for us and our continually believing in that. And then the effects of that in our lives. There's no question that the, the Spirit of God assures us of His presence with us as we walk with Him, as we obey Him. And that's part of what First John is about, is the more we walk with Christ, the more we obey Christ, the more we live out the life of Christ, the more our assurance grows. It's not that we're earning salvation by what we're doing. It's that we're assured of the salvation we already have because we see evidence of the Spirit of Christ working in us. So I would encourage anybody who's wrestling with these things, these are good things to wrestle with. So examine, what, is it, what does Scripture teach about what it really means to follow Christ? Repent and believe. Has this been a reality? Has this been become a reality in my life? And then spend time in First John and ask questions about, it. am I continually believing in Christ? Am I continually following Christ? And where are areas where I need to repent of sin that's, that's creeping back into my life? And as the Spirit works that conviction in our heart, the Spirit's work is actually, in a sense, affirming us that we're His child, and He's drawn us into deeper and deeper intimacy with Himself. These are good questions to ask. They're questions we need to ask. So you can see what I mean. I mean, MK, she said in her comments, she's confused. I would understand being confused by listening to these guys because they're both, uh, like the one guy just kept saying, it's not confusing, it's not confusing. And just because you say it's not confusing doesn't mean it's not confusing. Um, and when you rattle off stuff so fast and throw out verses and you kind of are communicating to your people that if you do have a question, there's something wrong with you. Like you're, you're less than, you're not understanding, you're not, you know, part of this because you don't understand. And it's not confusing and just keep saying it over and over again. And then David Platt here at the end, he's kind of saying, like, it's okay to ask these questions and we want to know, like, this whole salvation piece and our assurance of it. But somehow we're just going to know through that assurance somehow. And again, it leaves people questioning because I know people that have gone to church for a long time that have asked the question, how do I know that I'm saved? Or, um, you know, what, what is this assurance that I can have? And I think that when we have the assurance question, it's because we don't understand why this whole gig happened in the first place. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? I think if we have a full understanding of that and we truly do understand what that is, it answers the assurance questions. It answers life's questions that filter through the salvation question or the salvation experience of any person who is looking for hope, looking for that salvation, under, trying to turn to or understand what Christianity really is. So with that being maybe our foundation moving forward, and again, if you have questions as I'm going along with this, I'm going to try and just take it through a very systematic process so that you can clearly understand and be able to communicate it to someone else. Ask questions and I'll do my best to answer or clarify as we go along. So we're going to start off with what's going to be the beginning of the Bible and that is creation. And as God created, he created the world perfect. I think we understand that. Perfection in the world, perfection in all that he created from the from the, the geology itself, the, the stars, the universe, as well as the animals that were created, and as well as humanity. Man and woman created everything perfect, just the way God designed it. 
So this is how everything begins, and this is what we're pointing to at the end, okay? So Revelation is the bringing us back to that, and, but at the beginning, we somehow lost it, okay? So those are the bookends for understanding why we need a Redeemer and why Jesus had to do what Jesus had to do. So that's the first part. You always have to start with an understanding that God made everything perfect, and we are definitely moving to that perfect place yet again. The thing that happened quickly right off the bat is there's all kinds of words for this. I'm going to call it injustices. There's injustice in the world um, in a very religious setting, uh, which you know not everybody that you're talking to is. You might put sin in there, but sin can be a confusing word for people because people use that in all kinds of different ways. But injustices are basically where things have gone wrong and people are victimized, people are hurt, people are injured. People are abused. Injustices happen, and those injustices are sin. That happened right away. That's that story of Adam and Eve and the serpent and the fruit from the tree. That's the the beginning of those injustices. Those weren't God's plan. Those weren't God's design. But Adam and Eve decided together that they wanted something more than what God was offering. And so they broke out of that kind of looking to be their own God, looking to be their own person, not to fall under God's rules. And every single person has been doing that ever since. That's, that's kind of our, our pattern on our way of living. But there was a problem, of course, that happened when this took place because now evil exists. So people have a problem with evil. Like how could God create evil? Well, what God created was perfection. And the injustices that we would cause, cause evil in our world. The evil is from us. The evil is as a result of my choices to you, or your choices to me, or to someone else. That's where evil exists. It doesn't exist in what God created. It, it exists in our free will, our choices, the, the things that we wanted to do with our world and our lives. So, you'd say, well, then God should just get rid of evil. So logically... If evil is us and God wants to get rid of evil, what does God have to do? Get rid of us. That is the only way to get rid of the evil, because the evil is us. It's our choices, the decisions that we're making. It's not like it's this other thing out there somewhere that God could just say, oh, I'm just going to get rid of evil, because evil is from us. We're the ones that choose it. We're the ones that do it. You remember the story of Noah, right? I mean, there's a cleansing, right? Where God gets rid of, just leaves Noah and his family. And when this whole thing is over and they land right off the bat, sinning all over again. God said, never again am I going to destroy the earth with a flood. But there needed to be something, something that would fix, that would heal, that would do something to keep us from this condition of evil that makes it to where we can't even be in God's presence. He, he can't be around evil. He can't be around these injustices. Because it's us saying that we want to be our own God. Or we don't need God. We don't want God. And for us to be in relationship with him, that has to be removed. But the only way to remove it was to remove us. Because death is the only way. Separation from God. That was the only way to get rid of, of evil. Does it make sense so far? I want to be too confusing. This isn't confusing <laughs> just because I say it, right? So, the Bible is the story of redemption. The Bible is a story of ridding the world of evil without destroying humanity. That's what the scriptures are about. That's what the scarlet thread of redemption is. It's about how God figured out and implemented a plan to rid the world of evil without destroying mankind, which is where it came from in the first place. So what God started with is he started with something called animal sacrifice, which you've heard about and read about if you read the Old Testament. And the simplest way to put this is that the sin that you committed that separated you from God was transferred to that animal. And that animal's throat was slit and its blood poured out, and it died in the place of the person who should die separated from God. So it was placed on the animal. And in that moment, you know, kind of as the Bible talks about, that life is in the blood. And so 
as that life is taken, that blood would be symbolic of a cleansing of the person who offered the sacrifice and they would be made righteous. They would be made like as if they hadn't done these injustices because the penalty for that injustice was paid through the death of the animal. The priest would even take some of that blood and would sprinkle it. And it's the idea that the land itself is even purified through that sacrifice so that God and man, humanity, creation, can come back together with God in this union. Animal sacrifice. It was so important and it was done all the time and it was a, a major part of this religious process of being clean and made right before God so that you wouldn't have to suffer this separation from God. So, we've got perfect creation. We've got humanity that comes into it that causes the injustices. That can't be a part of God. So God has to remove the evil, but he can't, doesn't want to remove humanity. So he creates animal sacrifice. The animal sacrifice, the sin of the man, is placed upon the animal, and the animal dies in place of the person. So the person can be clean, humanity can survive, yet the animal has to die for the person. Well, this is imperfect for obvious reasons, because every time you sin, another animal has to die. Again and again and again, year after year after year after year. It's a very imperfect process because it's not like we did the sacrifice for the, of the animal and then lived right with God. We just continued to sin. In fact, it got so bad along the way that um, even the prophet Isaiah said this is out of hand. Like the people are just sinning and sinning and sinning and their sacrifices are meaning nothing because as soon as they're sacrificing, they're sinning and this isn't right. And he said the day is going to come when God is going to raise up a king and that king is going to give his life for the people. And he's going to be one sacrifice once and for all. Isaiah said that way back in the Old Testament, way before Jesus ever showed up. And so this was what they were looking forward to. This is what needed ultimately to happen. Because the sacrifices didn't actually get rid of the evil. It just covered it for a period of time, for a season, until sin happened all over again for the person. So then comes Jesus on the scene. This is where God steps into humanity and says, I'm going to fix this once and for all. I'm going, to, I'm going to offer a sacrifice like the animal sacrifice. That is a sacrifice so significant that it will cover the sins of humanity, past, present, and future. All sin will be covered by this one sacrifice. The only sacrifice he could give that would do that was a sacrifice of himself. So he came in the form of Jesus to earth. Fully God, fully man, on earth, showing us how to live righteous before God, teaching us to be righteous. And then finally, at the end, gave himself as a, as a sacrifice, a ransom, an atonement, paying the price, covering up, replacing. And so Jesus dies so that we can be forgiven of the sin that we continue to commit. And the moment this happens, there's no longer any need for animal sacrifice. There's no longer any need for animals to be sacrificed because Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice for all people. All people. That's what he came here to do. Throughout the New Testament, we read, as the writers wrote, that Jesus' death was an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It covers the debt that humans owe God. That's what that sacrifice did. It covers the debt that us humans owe God for the, our role in contributing to evil and death in the world. It covered that. The Bible also talks about Jesus bringing purification through his sacrifice. And again, this is that same idea of sprinkling the blood around of the sacrifice so that God and people could be back together again, that they could be one again, that they could be, we could be in God's presence again. That is why Jesus sacrificed himself for us. He gave up his life so that we could live, so we wouldn't have to have that death. That was the whole point of it. And Jesus' death, unlike the animal sacrifices, this is the cool part for, for Christianity as well, is that Jesus' sacrifice, his death, was not a final death. He didn't stay dead. 
I mean, if he would have, I guess there'd be some, you know, if you theologically try to figure that out, I mean, there's some significance to his death, even if he didn't resurrect, but the resurrection proves that he had power over death and proves that he has power for us over death, for eternal life, our presence with him for all eternity. So because he lives, he can offer that life to everyone who wants to be cleansed, everyone that wants to be covered by the sacrifice that he made. So no more sacrifice needed. Animal sacrifice, that is. But there are two things that were initiated for the church. The church being those people that were following Jesus that are tapping in to that sacrifice that Jesus made. Two things. First one um, that was required is baptism. And baptism is us as followers of Jesus identifying with his death as we go underwater and with his resurrection as we come up. Death to sin, resurrection to new life. So it symbolizes the new life that we have in Christ because we benefit from his death. So that's why baptism is so important for us as believers because it's a symbolic act that we do on what it means to be uh, dead in Christ and then raised to new life in Christ. So if you have not been baptized, I encourage you to do this. This is such an important part of your faith and a part of your faith journey. So... We have this this idea of of baptism. And the second thing that was instituted was what we would call communion or the Lord's Supper. When Jesus at that Passover meal sat with his disciples and talked about his body and his blood, that his body would be broken for them and his blood would be poured out for them. Again, this purification act, this sacrificial act, so that they could be saved. And then he said, I want you to do this. And every time you do this, every time you have this piece of bread and every time you have this cup, I want you to do it in remembrance of me. Remember this moment. Remember what I've done for you. So it's important, church, for 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years, I want you to remember this sacrifice. And you're going to do it through this communion act. So you're going to be baptized and you're going to celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper. And that's going to symbolize the sacrifice that was made and why it was made and what it means for you as a believer in Jesus Christ. So these are two ways that we remember. And they connect us to the story of Jesus. They remind us of the power that we have within us to overcome evil. Because we have the Holy Spirit that allows us to do that. So, how confusing is that? There's creation. And after creation, there's evil. That's what we bring to this. Then there's God's work of redemption. First was the animal sacrifice. That was limited, but it was the the only way to remove it from us, uh, place it on the animal so that the price was paid. But that evil continued in us. So God had an ultimate plan. and His ultimate plan was Jesus Christ, in which there is then no more evil. If you read the book of John, the first first chapter talks about this whole thing, about who Jesus is, and that he was in the beginning, but also he is today, that he was a part of creation and things were created through him, but yet he is still today. So Jesus didn't show up just because he was born, because Jesus is God and God has always been. I want to read a couple of verses for you. John chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. John wrote this. He said, But to all you who believe him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. So if you believe in Christ, if you've accepted the sacrifice that he's made, he gives you the right to become children of God. And they are reborn, not with physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but birth that comes from God. This renewal, this new life, this identification with his death and resurrection. Verse 14, so the word became human. And made his home among us. That was Jesus. And he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory. The glory of the Father's one and only Son. So, here we are. We are not that perfect creation. But we are also not in that animal sacrificial system either. We are in the places, a place right now in history in God's redemptive plan of the sacrifice that Jesus made. So we are, we are not in the perfect place. We're not 
in the animal sacrifice place, but we are in the place of where Jesus made the sacrifice, and we benefit from that today. But we are able to be saved today, right here, right now. You are able to be saved today by being forgiven. And in that forgiveness, sin is conquered. And that sin then is not counted against us. It's not because of what we did. It's not because we offered some animal and we did some sacrifice, but it's because of what God did for us. So assurance of salvation comes from someone who says, I choose to accept that atoning work that Jesus did. I'm just going to do my best to live my life for him. You're not going to do it perfect. You are going to make mistakes. But the mistakes don't condemn you anymore because of what Jesus did. And people that are unsure of their salvation are unsure of the atoning work of Jesus, that it actually covered it all, that it actually forgave sin. Because we think, no, but I did this thing. That can't be covered. All sin covered by what Jesus did. And our job is to tap into that and try and love others the way that God loves us. And he loves us and forgives us in the midst of our messes. And we need to love others in the midst of their messes. And he forgives us even though we reject him. And we need to forgive others even though they reject us. We do the best we can to reflect Christ. But how well you reflect Christ is not determined on on whether you're saved or not. It's whether you trust in the the sacrifice and the, the, the salvation that Jesus offers through his sacrifice. It's just so hard because we want to earn it. And you can't earn it. You can't do enough good. Jesus did it all. He's the one that saves us. There's a quote that says that there cannot be peace without first a great suffering. I would say the greater the suffering, also the greater the peace. At the beginning of creation, day one of creation, God knew that every single person, he knew every person that he was going to create. He knew every person that he was going to make. It was part of his creation plan, all of creation. He knew and he orchestrated and he implemented. He gave each person a time in history when they would be born. He gave each person a family that he would bless that family with. He was going to be creating people throughout a timeline of history, and they would be a gift to that generation. The day is going to come when there will be no more people that God is creating. When he reaches the number of all that he decided and designed to create. And when that story has been written, when that time has come, that will be the time that Jesus returns. That will be the final end of all of this in which he will come and there will no longer be evil. And those that are still bent on evil, still bent on that direction and rejecting God, that will be the end. That will be the ultimate death of evil. And there'll be those of us that will be with Christ in this new experience, this new existence with him. Back to that perfect place as it was all the way at the beginning with the garden. You see, Jesus saves And not just on the cross. Not just at the return of Jesus will he save. And not just in some spiritual way does he save you. But Jesus saves today. You see, you and I need redemption from our sin. We all need redemption. And in that redemption, we can be saved. We can enter heaven. We can know that we are saved. And though it's true about the future, it is still also true about today. He saves us today. Because I need a Jesus that can save me now. I assume you do as well. I need the universal saving, but I also need the saving of today. You see, God sees you. I mean that in some negative way. I mean that in a very positive way. God sees you. He knows you. He created you. You are his. You are special to him. When you trust Jesus, you are forgiven. But God will also come and rescue you today. So what is it that you need saving from? What is it in life you need saving from? What story in your life do you need rewritten? 
What story in your life do you need to see the scarlet thread of redemption to run through? That's what the scriptures are. Examples of stories where that scarlet thread runs through. It ran through those stories and it runs through your story. Where do you need God to show up? You need him to show up in your marriage? You need him to show up in your finances? With your kids? With your job? Your family? Your friends? You need God to show up in the addictions or in the abuse that you've experienced, in the mistreatment, in the injustice, in the sin. See, God knows you. He knows. You're not hidden from him. God's never forgotten you. In fact, the injustice and the evil in this world have hurt you. It's hurt me. It's hurt you. It's hurt all of us. But Jesus is here to save us today, not just sometime in the future. All of heaven's army will come and destroy evil. There is victory in Christ. And today you can be whole again. Yes, we're still going to live in an imperfect world. We're still going to live in a world of injustice, but you can be made whole. Because you've not gone too far away from him. And he's near to you even now. You see, in desperation, a stranded person is going to send up an SOS signal, right? They need to be found. They need to be rescued in some way. They send out their distress call. I'm in serious trouble. Deserted on an island. I don't know why that's the only place we ever see SOS, right? But I'm deserted. It's been deserted. I, I, need, I need rescue one way or another. You see, our prayer to God can be really our SOS call, our distress call to him. So to close the service today, I'm going to invite uh, Kelsey and Tarina, and they are going to close us out with a song. And it is a song that um, speaks to this exact point that we're talking about here today. You know, maybe this pandemic that we're in has revealed some things to you. Maybe it's revealed that, you know, you need to address some things in your own life. You know, maybe it has revealed for you that uh, you need to reconnect with God in some way. Maybe you need to have a fresh touch from God even here, right now, in this moment. Maybe you're hopeless and you need hope. And I encourage you to make this song your SOS call. The song is called Rescue.
Father God, I pray that you will help us to realize and understand that the sacrifice that you made for us is once and for all. And that in you we can be saved even though we see in our life the injustice that still lives there. And that we cause problems and others cause problems for us, but you are there to rescue us, that you are our redeemer. And that not only through Jesus' sacrifice that we can be saved tomorrow, but that you will rescue us today, that we can have hope, and that things that are wrong can be made right, and that we can love and we can forgive, we can be forgiven, we can offer forgiveness, and that the kingdom of God, though it is not yet, it can draw near still today. That your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So we thank you for the truth of this. Help us not to confuse this in our mind, but to celebrate as those first Christians did in calling what it truly is, good news. So again, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for redemption. Thank you for your sacrifice. And thank you that we get to tap into it and that we have the privilege of offering it to others. Thank you very, very much. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you move on into your week, uh, I don't know what is in store for you, but it's going to be a mixed bag no matter what. But we look forward to connecting with you at other opportunities throughout the week. Definitely playing this game on Wednesday with the Strohs. It's going to be a lot of fun. Come join us to be a part of that. This Thursday, 7 o'clock, Hillcrest Live. That'll be a fun event um, as well. And then we'll come back together next week, and we're going to kind of uh, wrap this uh, redemption series up with that final piece of artwork. Can't wait to show you the one on Revelation. Super, super cool. And we got, oh yeah, business meeting is happening, well, in about 20 minutes. So grab a little something to eat. And uh, yeah, I know you've just like foaming at the mouth for this. You're just like loving the business meeting. So God bless you all. Thank you for coming and being a part of church today. Have a great day. All right. And then you break it out into the different units, 320 and 5. And then you break out the bottom units, 10 and 15. But all you actually have to do is multiply this 5 by that 5 and then multiply it by the 2. But that's not the way they're doing it anymore. If you looked at the book, you would have seen. You break but it out into these different units. why did they change it? It worked quadrants. when I was a kid. Well, they want to do it now this way, okay? It's more organized information, I guess. This isn't so organized. 3,000, 10 times 20 is 200.